Heavenly Father, thanks for today and uh, thank you for your word. It's a cold morning and yet, Heavenly Father, we know that your word offers warm consolation. As we study what your son Jesus has to say, we ask that you would bless us, enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we would see, receive, and believe what you speak. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, every once in a while, uh, myself and my wife Melody and now Hope we will go to the pool that is in our neighborhood. And truth be told, I cannot swim, so I'm not a big fan of the pool. But I still like going with my family, have a good time. And usually when we go to the pool, not only are we there, but other families are there, usually with their kids. And it's interesting because the kids, a lot of them are just learning how to do what I never learned how to do, which is swim. And so they like to do all sorts of fun things in the pool. They will swim and they will flip and they will dive and they will float. And whenever they do something that they think is going to be kind of interesting, they always feel the need to announce to their parents who are with them their aquatic acrobatics. And so they have three words that they will say to their parents to put them on notice that they are about to do something really cool at the pool. You know what those three words are? Look at me. That's what they say over and over and over again at the pool. Mom, Dad, look at me, splash. Mom, Dad, look at me, dive. Mom, Dad, look at me, hold my breath under the water. Mom, Dad, they will say, look at me. You know, right now we're in this series. It's called History's Most Memorable Speech. And the idea behind this series is that we live in a world that is full of information overload. We have more access to more information in more ways than we ever have before in the history of our world. But because we have so much information that is coming at us all of the time, A lot of it just kind of gets lost in the clutter and and the clamor. We forget most of what we hear. But every once in a while, somebody will say something that is so compelling and so profound and so engaging that we remember it. And one thing that has been said that is very compelling and very profound and very engaging is a speech by Jesus. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says things like, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says things like, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says things like, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. These are all lines from the Sermon on the Mount, and my guess is you know at least one of these lines, if not all of these lines, because these lines are memorable. Even 2,000 years after they were spoken, these lines stick in your head. And so what we're doing in this series, History's Most Memorable Speech, is we are just digging around in the speech from Jesus, and we are asking, what is really there? Because there is a reason this speech is so well remembered and so well regarded. This was a speech that changed our world, and this is a speech that can change our lives. And so this morning, as we continue through our series, we're going to be taking a look at how to respond and react to a world that is obsessed with three simple words, and the three words are, look at me. You know, as adults, we usually do not speak these words. These words are usually reserved for little kids who are trying to get their parents to watch them at the pool. And yet, even if we don't always speak these words... We sure do live out these words. A couple of weeks ago when the San Francisco 49ers were playing the Seattle Seahawks in the NFC Championship game, and after the Seahawks eked out a win, there was a sports reporter, her name was Erin Andrews, and she was talking to Seahawks cornerback Richard Sherman. And she was talking to him about how he thought the game went, and Sherman kind of went a little bit nuts in the post-game interview He said, I'm the best cornerback in the game. When you try me with a sorry receiver like Crabtree, that's the result you're going to get. Don't you ever talk about me, he says. And Aaron Andrews, quite honestly, had no idea what in the world Richard Sherman was talking about. And so Aaron Andrews says, hey, who was talking about you? Crabtree, Sherman says, don't open your mouth about the best or I'm going to shut it for you real quick, he responds. And that was the end of one of the strangest post-game interviews that I think I have ever seen. Now, I'll be real honest with you, okay? Before this interview, I had no earthly idea who Richard Sherman was. But now I do. Because he opened his mouth. It got played over and over again on SportsCenter. 
And underneath everything else he said in that post-game interview were three simple words. You know what they were? Look at me. And you know what? Everybody did. It worked. Recently, I finished reading a book on the life and times of President Kennedy. And I learned a lot of fascinating facts about President Kennedy's life and administration and assassination. But one of the most interesting things that I learned as I was reading this book on the life and times of President Kennedy was not about President Kennedy, but about a guy, Lee Harvey Oswald, who was his assassin. And what I learned that I never had known before was that before Lee Harvey Oswald killed President Kennedy, he tried to kill somebody else, U.S. Major General Edwin Walker. Edwin Walker was an avowed anti-communist. Lee Harvey Oswald had communist sympathies, and so Lee Harvey Oswald wanted to take out this general. And so he perched outside of his house while the general was in his study one night, and he took a shot at the general, and you know what happened? He missed. Wasn't able to kill the general. Now, Lee Harvey Oswald was disappointed that he wasn't able to kill the general, but what he was even more disappointed about was that after the police had found out that somebody had tried to kill the general, they launched an investigation, and they couldn't figure out who tried to do it. And that devastated Lee Harvey Oswald because more than anything else, he wanted to be known. He wanted notoriety. He wanted people to know who Lee Harvey Oswald was. He lived his life by the motto of three words. You know what they were? Look at me. You know, I was thinking about this. Here's the problem when we live our lives just trying to get the world to look at us. One of the things that frustrates me is the terrible traffic that we have here in San Antonio. That's one of the reasons that I'm actually very thankful that we live close to Concordia because that way I can avoid the congested commutes on the highways. But every once in a while, I'll have to run an errand across town, go across town to go pick something up, and I get on a major road. And when I do, inevitably, I get caught in a traffic jam, usually because of a wreck. And so I'll sit there and I'll be inching along at like five miles an hour for 30 minutes. And I finally get to the side of the wreck that has been slowing all of this traffic down, that has been tying all of this traffic up. And when I get there, a lot of times what will happen is that I will notice the wreck is not on my side of the road. The wreck is on the other side of the road. But people on my side of the road are doing what is called rubbernecking. They're slowing down to see what has happened because they want to know what has gone on on the other side of the road. You know, guys, when we live our lives with this motto, look at me, when we crave recognition more than anything else, here's what usually winds up happening. We usually wind up just making a wreck out of our lives. People may stop, and they may stare, and they may look at us, but it's just because they're rubbernecking. It's just because they want to see the catastrophe and the disaster that we have made out of our lives. And that is why Jesus says the goal that we should have for our lives is not to get other people to look at us. Because when we do, when we live our lives saying, look at me, We just wind up wrecking our lives. And this takes us to our text for today. Matthew chapter 6, because in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to talk to us about the wreck that we can make out of our lives when we live our lives by the motto, look at me. And so our text for today, Matthew 6, beginning at verse 1. If you've got a Bible out of the back of the room, it's going to be on page 684. Page 684, Matthew 6 beginning at verse 1. Jesus says, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them, to say to the world, Look at me. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Now, I want to pause right there because in order to understand what Jesus is going to say about a world that is obsessed with people looking at them, I need to make a distinction between public acts and acts that are for the public. Because this is going to be an important distinction in understanding what Jesus is going to say here in Matthew chapter 6. Most of us from time to time in our lives have to do public acts whether we want to or not. 
Most of us have to give a speech in school or at the office. Most of us have to perform in a school musical once upon a time. Most of us have to make a presentation to a board or some other entity. When Jesus says, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, here is what Jesus is not doing, very important. He is not precluding any and every public act. We all do public acts. What Jesus is concerned about, however, are acts that are for the public. A way in which we live our lives that says to the public and everybody around us, look at me. I'm a great guy. I'm a great gal. I deserve to be noticed. Jesus is not just concerned with us doing acts of righteousness before men. He's concerned with us doing acts of righteousness before men. And then the qualifier that he adds, to be seen by them. Doing our good deeds so that everybody will look at us. Jesus says, when you live your life that way, when you live your life not only in public, but in a way that is for the public, something has gone terribly wrong. Because your acts of of righteousness should never be done to impress men. Rather, they should be done out of devotion to God. And so, Jesus continues, Matthew 6, verse 2, he says, when you give to the needy, Do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be done in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Jesus gives us some guidance on how not to do acts that are for the public, how not to live in a way that says to the world, look at me. And specifically, Jesus is going to talk about three acts of righteousness that we can also, that we can often be tempted not only to do in public, but for the public. And these three acts of righteousness are charity, prayer, and fasting. Charity, prayer, and fasting. These three acts of righteousness were considered to be the pillars of piety in ancient Judaism. Kind of an interesting line from the book of Tobit. The book of Tobit was written after the end of the Old Testament, before the beginning of the New Testament. Tobit says this, Prayer is good when accompanied by fasting, almsgiving, and righteousness. And so notice, three pillars of Jewish piety there, fasting, almsgiving, that's charity, and prayer. And Jesus is going to take on these three pillars of righteousness, and he's going to talk about how they should be done. And so Jesus begins with the pillar of charity. And there are three things that I want you to notice about Jesus' words concerning charity. First thing that I want you to notice is that Jesus says charity is not optional. Charity is not optional. Notice at the beginning of verse 2, Jesus says, So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets. Jesus does not say, if you give to the needy, but when you give to the needy. You know why? Because Jesus makes an assumption that we're going to be giving to the needy. Jesus makes an assumption that we are going to be charitable because charity is commanded by God. Romans 12, verse 13. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Hebrews 13, verse 16. Do not forget to do good and share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. 1 John 3, verse 17. If anybody has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? According to the Bible, over and over and over again, charity is a big deal. Jesus assumes that we're going to be charitable. It's not about if we give, it's about when we give. Now, part of the reason that charity is such a big deal for Jesus is because charity goes to the very core of God's character. One of the things that we believe about God fundamentally is that God is charitable. That's why the most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he what? He gave. He was charitable with his one and only son. 
He gave him to us so that our sins would be forgiven. When we believe in him, we don't perish but have everlasting life. God is charitable, and that means that we ought to be charitable too. You know, it's kind of interesting when Jesus talks about giving here. When he says, when you give to the needy, uh, the Greek word there is elaos. This is a root word that means mercy. And this right here is our God's character. He's a merciful God. That's why he gives to us his one and only son. We ought to be merciful people. That's why we give to other people of what has first been given to us. And so that's the first thing Jesus would tell us about charity. He would say, hey, charity, it's not optional. Charity is not about if, it's about when. Second thing you need to know about charity, according to Jesus, is this. Charity is personal. Charity is personal. Jesus says in verse 2, when you give to the needy. Now, it's interesting because in Greek, there's a distinction between a singular you and a plural you. And when Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking to hundreds, if not thousands of people. And so he's talking to many yous, and yet when Jesus talks about charity, the you in Greek here is not plural, it's singular. Because Jesus is making giving very personal. It's not about what somebody else gives, it's about what you give, because nobody else can give for you. You know, I remember my dad trying to teach me this lesson. Charity is personal from a very young age. Every week I would get a dollar for my allowance. But I wouldn't get the whole dollar. I'd have to split it up. 70 cents was mine. I could spend it at my discretion. Then 20 cents I had to put into a savings account. And then 10 cents I had to put into the offering plate as a tithe every single Sunday. And I'll be honest, I got frustrated with my dad every once in a while. And I actually tried to tell him one day, hey, dad, We already give as a family. Why do I need to give out of my allowance? I was thinking, hey, I could keep that 10 cents for myself, go buy a gumball or something. But my dad tried to explain to me, you know what? It's not about what just we as a family give. It's about what you as a person gives. You need to practice giving some of your allowance. You know why? Because charity is personal. The question is not what can somebody else give. The question is, what can you give? That's a question that we ought to be asking ourselves because that's a question that Jesus asks of us. Charity is personal. That's the second thing Jesus tries to teach us about charity. Third thing that Jesus tries to teach us about charity is this. Charity is not only personal, charity is also private. Charity is not only personal, Charity is private. Jesus says in verse 2, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. Now, when you first read this command, it almost sounds like the easiest command in the world to obey, doesn't it? Because how many of you have some trumpet fanfare every single time you stick a check in the offering plate? Anybody bring a trumpeter along with them to worship? I mean, this sounds like almost a no-brainer of a commandment to obey. And yet, it's really not about the trumpets. It's about the attitude. Jesus says there are many people who have an attitude of ostentation when they give. They like to show off what they are able to give. You know, probably one of the most famous stories about showy giving, ostentatious giving, comes in Mark chapter 12. Jesus is at the temple, and it says, Mark 12, verse 41, Jesus sat down at the opposite place where the offerings were being put in, and he watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people, it says, threw in large amounts. And so here's the scene. Jesus is at the temple, and he's watching all of these people with a lot of means put in very large amounts of money into the temple treasury. Question, how does Jesus know that they're putting in large amounts into the temple treasury? It's because when the people gave in that day and age, they liked to show off. They loved to throw all of their big golden coins into the temple treasury, listen to them ring in the coffer, because that was a sign and a symbol of how righteous you were. It was all based on how much you were able to give. People in the first century, they loved to show off when they were given. That's what makes what happens next in the story all the more striking. Mark 12, verse 42. A poor widow came. 
and put in two very small copper coins. Question, how does everybody know that? Because even if you didn't want to be showy, everybody was watching. Because charity was meant to be a source of spiritual pride. This woman has hardly anything to give. Mark says the two copper coins are worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything. All she had to live on. You know, whenever I read this story, I can't help but think of how this widow must have felt. All eyes fixed on her as she walked up to the front of the temple to give her offering, her offering so much less than all the offerings that had come before her. And yet, even though everybody else's coins rang louder in the offering box, this woman throws in her meager pittance. Because she knows that giving is not about putting on a show. It's about your heart. And that's really what Jesus notices. Jesus notices more than what she gives, she notices how she gives. He notices her heart. You know, one more thing on giving in the first century. It's kind of interesting. Jesus says, when you give, do not announce it with trumpets. There's a biblical scholar. His name is Joachim Jeremias, and he's done some research on this. And he talks about how the treasury boxes at the temple were actually in the shape of trumpets. They looked like this. At the top, you see kind of the opening of the trumpet, and what you do is you throw your coins into the opening of the trumpet, and then it would fall down into the offering box. And so it gets narrower as it falls down into the offering box, and the reason they designed their offering boxes like this was so that thieves would not reach into the offering box and steal the coins out. This is kind of the ancient version of monetary security. And so Jesus sees these offering boxes that look like they have trumpets on the top of them. And Jesus basically says, hey, some of you, when you give at the temple, you are so much all about yourself. You love to show off so much, you might as well just take that offering box and start playing a tune and congratulating yourselves. Because that's how proud of yourselves you are. But Jesus says, you know, that's not the way that charity is supposed to work. Charity is not about how great you are. Charity is about your heart. And that's why charity is to be private. You know, Jesus says, if you give with an attitude that says, look at me, you've already received your reward in full. Yeah, everybody may look at you. You may receive accolades, adulation, adoration, and applause from people who are watching and think that you're really pious and you're really good. But Jesus says you're not going to get a reward from God. You've already received a reward from men. Why do you need a reward from God? You see, for Jesus in Matthew 6, rewards are kind of an either-or proposition. You can either get a reward from men who are impressed by how pious you are, or you can get a reward from God who sees what you do in your heart. But you cannot have both. You cannot have both a reward from God and a reward from men. You can either have one or the other, but not both. Uh, one of the most popular shows on TLC right now is something called Extreme Couponing. It's a reality show that chronicles the lives of shoppers who go to extremes to find the best deals on groceries. In the pilot episode, a lady from Maryland got $2,000 worth of groceries for $100 using coupons. Incredible. Now, one of the reasons these shoppers can get such amazing deals is because they can double, triple, and quadruple their coupons on one item. In fact, I saw this one show where this woman actually walked out of the grocery store with the grocery store owing her money she had used so many coupons. The grocery store had to pay her to go shopping. Now, when I go shopping, I use coupons thanks to my wife. She's a coupon clipper. But I do not do extreme couponing. Partly because I don't think either one of us are patient enough to go and find tons of duplicates of coupons to use over and over and over again on one item. But the other reason that we don't do extreme couponing is because at the bottom of the coupons that we get, there's always this little notice, and the notice says, limit. One per customer cannot be combined with any other offer. 
And so I cannot use four coupons on one item. I just can't. It's one coupon per item. Now, sometimes I'll go to the grocery store, I go to HEB, and I'll have the stack of manufacturer's coupons that I will use to try to purchase certain items. Every once in a while, I'll get to that item, and right there underneath the item, HEB has these little yellow coupons that you can use. And so sometimes I'll see a yellow coupon for something that I already have a manufacturer's coupon for, and then I've got to make a call because the limit is one per customer, and my coupons cannot be combined with any other options. This is not a both-and proposition for me. This is an either-or proposition for me. Which coupon am I going to use? The manufacturer's coupon that I already have or the little yellow coupon that is hanging right there by the item that I'm about to get? You know which coupon I always pick? Whichever one gives me the better deal. Whichever one saves me more. Here's the question that Jesus is trying to get us to ask when he talks about the rewards of God versus the rewards of men. Jesus says the rewards of God, they cannot be combined with any other offer. The rewards of men, they cannot be combined with any other offer. It's an either-or proposition. So which one, Jesus would ask us, do you think is the better deal? Getting a reward from men? Their accolades, adulation, adoration, and applause or getting a reward from God. You can't have both. You can only have one. That's what Jesus has to say about the Jewish pillar of charity. Now, Jesus continues by talking about the Jewish pillar of prayer. Matthew 6, verse 5 When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, don't keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think that they're going to be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, Jesus says, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Jesus moves from talking about the Jewish pillar of piety that is charity to talking about the Jewish pillar of piety that is prayer. And Jesus, just like He gives us some lessons on charity, also gives us some lessons on prayer. And the first thing that Jesus wants us to know about prayer is this. Prayer is done in secret. Prayer is done in secret. Jesus says, verse 6, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, it's important to note that when Jesus talks about secret prayer, he is not precluding all types and kinds of public prayer. There are instances over and over and over again in the Bible where people pray in public. Kind of a famous example, Acts chapter 1. The apostles are together, and they're trying to figure out what in the world they're going to do now that they are one apostle short, now that Judas has died. And so they narrow the field down to a couple of different men, Joseph and Matthias. And Peter stands up in front of the church. Acts 1 verse 15 says that there's about 120 people there. And you know what Peter does with the other apostles? They pray. Acts 1 verses 24 and 25. Lord, you know everyone's heart, the apostles say. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry that Judas has left to go where he belongs. And so here are the apostles, and you know what they're doing? They're not only praying, they're praying in public. Their prayer is not in secret. And so what's going on here? Well, it's interesting because when Jesus talks about charity, remember the you that he uses here is singular. He says, when you give, do not announce it with trumpets. And the you is not a plural you, it's a singular you. When Jesus talks about prayer, it's kind of interesting. He actually switches the you in Greek from a singular to a plural you. And so when Jesus talks about prayer, he doesn't just say, when you singularly pray, he says, when you all pray. You see, Jesus knows that there is a time for public prayer. Jesus knows that there is a time to pray as a body of believers. 
But there is never a time to offer a prayer that is for the public. Because just like there's a big difference between public acts and acts that are for the public, there's a big difference between public prayer and prayer that is for the public. Prayer that is meant to impress other people who are gathered around you. Kind of the quintessential example of a prayer that is for the public comes in a story that Jesus tells, Luke 18, beginning at verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and he prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, and adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I get. The tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven. But he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Then Jesus offers this commentary on a story. He says, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, the Pharisee, went home justified before God. For everybody who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You know what's interesting about this story? Both of these men are offering public prayers. They're both in a public place. At the temple in Jerusalem, lots of people can see them. They can see each other. But one is not only offering a public prayer, one is offering a prayer that is for the public. And that's the Pharisee. You know, Jesus says this Pharisee stands up in verse 11, and he prays about himself. The Greek word here for about is the word pros. And this is a preposition that means to or toward. And so the Pharisee is not only praying about himself, he's praying to himself. Because he didn't really care whether or not God hears his prayer. He cares about whether or not everybody else hears his prayer. Because he's not just praying to God. He's praying for the public. He wants everybody around him to be impressed at how righteous, how noble, how pious he really is. And Jesus is having none of it. You know, the other day, a letter came on my desk. And what was interesting about this letter that came across my desk was that this was a letter that I had just sent out a couple of days earlier. But apparently, I had gotten the address wrong on the letter. And so the letter came back to me, and it said, Return to sender, no forwarding address found. You know, Jesus says when you say a prayer for the public... You're putting the wrong address on your prayer. And it's going to come back to you. It's going to say return to sender because quite frankly, if you're praying for the public, God is going to open prayer mail that is not addressed to him. He doesn't want you to pray to impress other people. He wants you to pray so that you can learn how to trust him. And so this is the first thing you need to know about prayer. Prayer is done in secret. That doesn't mean that you never do a public prayer, but it does mean that you never do a prayer that is for the public. Second key characteristic of prayer is this. Prayer is non-coercive. Prayer is non-coercive. Jesus says in verse 7, when you pray, don't keep on babbling like the pagans. For they think that they will be heard because of their many words. You know, most pagan prayers kind of went like this. You'd go to a god, a deity, and you'd talk to the deity about the sacrifices that you had offered, the good deeds that you had done, the offerings that you had given, the noble kind of person that you were, and you would say to the deity, oh deity, I've done you all of these wonderful favors. I have lived a good and great life, and now that I have done all of these great things, please do something great for me. That's the way pagan prayer would work. It was kind of a quid pro quo. You scratch the deity's back, and the deity has to scratch your back. Prayer was essentially a way to try to coerce what you wanted out of a god. Now, it wasn't just the pagans who would pray in this kind of way. The ancient Jews would do the same thing. There were a lot of Jews who every single time before they prayed, they would offer a little sacrifice, an offering to God. And the idea behind the sacrifice and the offering to God was that if you gave God a little something, God would hear your prayer a little bit better. You've heard of pay to play, right? This was pay to pray. 
And a lot of the Jews kind of operated this way. Other Jews, they thought that they would be heard because they had really good oratory skills. And if they just kept on praying and praying and praying, using these big, long, theological, flowery words, God would hear them. I want to show you a quote from the Babylonian Talmud, an ancient compendium of Jewish rabbinical teaching. Babylonian Talmud says this, If one prays long, his prayer does not pass unheeded. That's the way that a lot of the Jews would look at prayers. As long as you prayed long and hard, as long as you used big fancy words, God would have to hear your prayer. But then Jesus comes along and says, no, that's not the way prayer works. You can't coerce God by talking to him about all the wonderful things that you've done. You can't impress God with your long flowery prayers. That's not the way prayer works. You know what I find really sad about this kind of prayer? We still have vestiges of this kind of prayer even in our day and age. Sometimes we think that as long as we just pray the right words, as long as we're just sincere enough in our prayers, fervent enough in our prayers, as long as we do the right things before God and then we go to him in prayer, God will have to give us what we ask for. Uh, Several years back there was a book that came out by a guy named Bruce Wilkinson. It was called The Prayer of Jabez. And it's based on a little known prayer in the Old Testament. And the idea behind the book was that as long as you prayed the prayer consistently and fervently, God was going to have to bless your socks off. Uh, There was this little quote at the beginning of the book. Bruce Wilkinson writes as he's opening the book. He says, I want to teach you how to pray a daring prayer that God always answers. It is brief, only one sentence with four parts and tucked away in the Bible, but I believe that it contains the key to a life of extraordinary favor with God. The petition has radically changed what I expect from God and what I experience every day by His power. In fact, thousands of believers who are applying its truths are seeing miracles happen on a regular basis. Now, let me be clear here, okay? If you want to pray the prayer of Jabez, go ahead and knock yourself out. But here's what God does not promise. God does not promise that if you pray Jabez's prayer, you're automatically going to get Jabez's results. He doesn't make that promise. God nowhere promises to give you lots of stuff. God nowhere promises to make you instantly wealthy. God nowhere promises that your life is going to be easy and breezy and wonderful. He doesn't make those kind of promises. And if you try to coerce God into making those kind of promises, you're going to learn a hard lesson. God will not be coerced. And so here's what I would say when it comes to prayer. Rather than trying to coerce what you want out of God, try to learn what God wants for you and then pray for that. Jesus says in verse 8, your father knows what you need even before you ask him. God knows what you need even before you do. And so maybe our prayers should not be so much about our wants as they should be about what God wants for us. This is one of the things that I love so much about the prayer that Jesus teaches right after he talks about prayer in Matthew chapter 6. He teaches a prayer that you guys probably know. It's called the Lord's Prayer. And one of the things that I love about the Lord's Prayer, among many other things, is that in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches us to pray for things about which we'd never normally pray. I mean, if it wasn't for the Lord's Prayer, how many times would we pray, Oh God, hallowed be your name. May your name be kept holy. That's what I really want out of life. How many times would we pray, Give us this day our daily bread. God, here's what I really want and here's what I really need. I want a loaf of bread. I'd like to pray for that. In fact, I won't even pray for the whole loaf. I'll just pray for enough bread for today. How many of us would normally and naturally pray that way? How many of us would normally and naturally pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us? Oh God, here's what I really want. I really want to be able to forgive that person who hurt me deeply and who I'm really mad at right now. How many of us would normally and naturally pray for those things? That's part of the reason I love the Lord's Prayer so much. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus gives us things that we would not normally and naturally pray for because the Lord's Prayer is not about what we want. It's about what God wants for us. 
And what God wants for us is always best. And so Jesus says, do not try to coerce God with your prayers. Do come to him in your prayers. Talk with him in your prayers. Ask of him in your prayers. And then trust in him for his perfect response. That's the second pillar of Jewish piety that Jesus covers. He talks about prayer. Third pillar of piety that Jesus covers is the pillar of fasting. Jesus says a little bit later in the chapter, Matthew 6, verse 16, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men that they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you're fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Jesus has a little talk with us about fasting, and the first thing you need to know about fasting is Jesus' attitude toward fasting. Jesus has an attitude toward fasting that says, fasting is good. Fasting is good. That's why when Jesus talks about fasting in verse 16, he doesn't say if you fast. He says when you fast. Jesus makes an assumption that we're going to fast because Jesus knows that fasting is good. You know, in our culture, even among Christians, a lot of times fasting is not widely regarded. There's a guy named Richard Foster. He wrote a book several years back called The Celebration of Discipline. And this is what he says about fasting. He says, in a culture where the landscape is dotted with shrines to the golden arches and an assortment of pizza temples, fasting seems kind of out of place, out of step with the times. In fact, fasting has been in general disrepute both inside and outside the church for many years. A lot of times because we have so much food at our fingertips, we don't take fasting very seriously. And yet Jesus says we really should. You see, fasting is valuable for two reasons. First reason fasting is valuable is because fasting can help reveal what controls us. Fasting can help reveal what controls us. For a lot of people, what controls them is food. We have instances of obesity. We also have instances of anorexia and bulimia. All of those are tributes to people being controlled by food. Jesus says fasting can help with that. It can say to food, food, you will no longer control me. Now, you need to know that when it comes to fasting, you can fast not only from food, you can fast from whatever controls you. It is good to say to something that has privilege over your life that it probably shouldn't have, it's good to say to that thing, you will control me no more, and fasting can help you with that. And so let's say technology controls you. You love all the latest gadgets and gasmos. Maybe it's time to take a little fast from technology. If TV controls you, you love sitting in front of the tube. Maybe it's time to take a little fast from TV starting, oh, right about this afternoon. What do you say? (laughs) If shopping controls you, if you maybe spend more than what you make and you put it all on your credit card, Maybe it's time to take a little break from shopping for things that you do not need and say to shopping, you will control me no more. Fasting is very valuable because it can break some bonds. Fasting reveals what controls us. Second thing we really need to know about fasting, though, is that fasting also reveals who sustains us. Fasting also reveals who sustains us. Again, Richard Foster says this. Fasting reminds us that we are sustained by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Food does not sustain us. God sustains us. Therefore, in experiences of fasting, we're not so much abstaining from food as we are feasting on the word of God. Fasting is feasting. I love that line because it's right. Yeah, food sustains our bodies, but God sustains our eternities. 
And you know what? When we fast, when our stomach rumbles and grumbles, it can remind us that even if we're not eating off a plate, we are eating from this book. And this book sustains, nourishes, and gives life to our souls. And so, this is what we need to know about fasting according to Jesus. Fasting is good. Now, a lot of people in Jesus' day they took fasting, which is a good thing, and they turned it into a pride thing. You know, in the Old Testament, fasting was commanded just one day a year on the Day of Atonement. This was the highest of the Old Testament high holy days. It was the day when all of Israel was to be forgiven by God. And what the religious leaders did was they took this one day that was commanded by God to issue a fast, and they said, hey, if one day a fasting is good, more days will be even better. And so the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they started adding all of these extra fast days. They figured, okay, Day of Atonement, that's a high holy day. We should probably fast on other high holy days too. Let's uh, fast on the Feast of the Passover, and let's fast on the Feast of the Ingathering. And then if we're going to fast on those days, you know, you kind of need some time to ramp up to fasting and to come down from fasting. And so we'll fast two days before these high holy days and two days after these high holy days for a total of five days. That'll be good. And then while we're at it, you know what? I think tradition has it that most... Moses went up the mountain, Mount Sinai, to receive the Ten Commandments on a Monday. Now, he came down several days later on a Thursday. Now, those are big days, and so every single week we should probably fast on Mondays and Thursdays so that we can commemorate what Moses has done as well. By the time the Jewish religious leaders got done with their fasting calendar, there was over 100 days on the calendar where you could not eat. Anybody want to sign up for that plan? But here's what the Jews did. They turned this into a source of spiritual pride. When they fasted, they wanted everybody to know it. They would walk around looking very disheveled, very forlorn. They would make sure that everybody could hear just how much their stomachs were grumbling and growling. They wanted everyone to know that they were fasting all 100 days in the calendar year and how difficult and painful it was and how committed they had to be to go through this. You know, let me show you a quote from the Mishnah. The Mishnah, another ancient compendium of Jewish rabbinical teaching. The Mishnah says this about fasting. The manner of fasting, how was it done? Each person puts ashes on his head. That's the way you'd fast if you were a pious Jew in the first century. You'd cover yourself in sackcloth and ashes and say, woe is me, I am fasting. Jesus says don't fast that way. Because if you fast that way, you're not fasting for God. You're fasting for men. You know, the early Christians, they did not jettison fasting. They they liked fasting. In fact, I told you the Jews would fast on Mondays and Thursdays. Now, in addition to those being the traditional days that Moses came up and down the mountain, the Jewish religious leaders also had another reason to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. Those were market days where everybody would set up their wares outside of the markets. And so uh, the cities would be packed with people who were going shopping on Mondays and Thursdays. And the Jewish religious leaders would walk around all of these packed markets with their sackcloth, with their ashes, so that everybody would know and see that they were fasting. Because they wanted to make a show of it. Now, Christians actually retained fasting two days a week, but they moved it to Wednesdays and Fridays because they knew that fasting was good, but they also knew that fasting was not meant to be a show. The problem that Jesus has is not with fasting. The problem that Jesus has is when you fast to impress other people. When you fast for someone other than the Lord. Jesus says, when you do that, you've received your reward in full. You know, finally, everything that Jesus has to say here about charity, about prayer, about fasting, everything that Jesus has to say here has to do with rewards. And Jesus says, your life can be lived by chasing after one of two rewards. You can either chase after the rewards of men, or you can go after the rewards of God. 
There are some people who go after the rewards of men. Matthew 6, verse 2, when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full. That's a reward. Matthew 6, verse 5, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full. They get a reward. Matthew 6, verse 16, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men their fasting. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full. They get a reward. Now, it's interesting because Jesus talks about how you can get a reward from men. The Greek word that Jesus uses here for reward is misthos. Now, misthos denotes a reward that you have worked for. You have strived for it. You have grappled for it. You have climbed for it. You have earned it. You deserve it. And now you get it. And that's the reward that a lot of people want. They want a reward from men that they have strived for. They want a reward from men that they have earned. They want to feel as though they deserve the accolades, applause, adulation, and adoration of other people. And Jesus says, you know what? You can get that kind of reward. You can get a misthos. You can get a reward that you can say, I have earned this. But you know, there's another kind of reward out there. Not a reward from men, but a reward from God. Matthew 6, verses 3 and 4. When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. It's a reward from God. Matthew 6, verse 6, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who's unseen. Then your Father who who sees what is done in secret will reward you. It's a reward from God. Matthew 6, verses 17 and 18, when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you're fasting, but only to your Father who's unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. It's a reward from God. Jesus says you can get lots of misthoses from men. You can get rewards from men, but you can also get a reward from God. Now, it's interesting because when Jesus talks about rewards from men, uh, the word that Jesus uses for rewards from men is the word misthos. But Jesus uses a different word when he talks about a reward from God. You know what word he uses? It's the word didomy. Now, what's a didomy? I'll tell you what a didomy is. Ephesians 2, verse 8, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the, anybody remember the next word? In Greek, it's a didomy. It's a gift from God. Jesus says, Men have their rewards, and you can earn them, you can grapple for them, you can strive for them, you can climb for them, and you may be able to just get them. God has a reward too, but it's not a reward that you earn. It's a reward that he gives out of his grace, out of his love, and out of his mercy. The world's rewards are based on your performance. God's reward flows from his compassion. Now here's the question, which reward will be your reward? You know, I was thinking about this the other day. I've been a pastor now for about 10 years. And I graduated seminary in 2004, and I can remember just how excited I was because I had worked really hard to get through seminary. I had worked really hard to get good grades. I had worked really hard to get academic scholarships. Most of all, I had worked really hard to get a single piece of paper. You know what that single piece of paper was? My diploma. And I can remember how excited I was on graduation day to finally get my diploma in hand. I inspected it carefully. I held it with a death grip. You know why? Because my diploma was a misthos. I had worked really, really hard for it, and I was so glad that I had earned it, that I deserved it after my four years of hard work. There's a problem with that misthos, though. The problem is 10 years have come and gone, and I have no idea where that piece of paper is. I don't even know if I'm really a pastor. Who knows? It got filed away, shoved in a closet somewhere. 
I've actually looked for it a couple of times. I cannot find it. It has disappeared, never to be heard from again. That was a cool mythos, but it wasn't a mythos that lasted. Now, I have another reward. I have a reward that is very precious to me, very special to me. In fact, so precious and so special to me that it hangs in my office. It's this. This is what I got for my first Father's Day. And it's my baby girl's little toes. And it just says, I love you, Daddy, from the top of my head to the tips of my toes. Love always, hope. Hope has great grammar and terrific penmanship. I have a feeling mommy may have had a little something to do with this. But I was thinking about that, which does hang on my wall, not my diploma. And I was thinking about how I did not do anything to deserve that. I did not do anything to earn that. It's not a mythos, it's a didomy. It's not a reward that I deserve, it's a reward that I've been given. You know which reward I like better? This one. That's a reward that is precious to me. That's a reward that fills and warms my heart. Which reward is precious to you? One that you earn from men? or one that you receive from God? One that you get because you've done well? Or one that you can rejoice in in spite of the fact that you're a sinner? One that lasts here on earth? Or one that endures for eternity? Jesus' invitation to us today is simply this. Don't strive for a mythos. Instead, receive a didomy. Because your heavenly Father wants to reward you. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the way that you give us your rewards, not because we've done anything to deserve them, but because you love us, you have compassion on us, you have grace and mercy for us. Father, as we think about these pillars of piety, charity and prayer and fasting, may we not do them so that we can somehow coerce you into giving us something good. May we do them out of our love for you. And Father, we know that you respond out of your love for us. We thank you for that. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week, guys. Walk with light.